Hey everyone, I'm your host, Adrian. We do content like this weekly, so hit the subscribe button and ring the bell to get notified. If you want more content like this, click the like button and please leave a comment. Thanks again for watching. Welcome everyone to today's Rupa Live class presented by Rupa University, the best way to learn about specialty lab work from industry experts. My name is Adrian Martinez and I'll be your host for this afternoon. Today we have a very special guest in Dr. Bahar Ismali here to talk to us about upper airway resistance, dysautonomia, and the crooked face epidemic. Before Hopping in a couple of quick housekeeping items. Everyone joining will be muted by default, but don't fret. If you do have any questions, go ahead and use that Q&A button down in your menu bar, and we will host a live Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Immediately following the Q&A, I will go through a quick demonstration of how to use Rupa Health. And then if you have to jump early, no worries at all. We are recording this session as we always do. And you'll be able to find it all on rupauniversity.com within the coming days, as well as we will distribute it out. And finally, if you are a fan of this type of content, be sure to check out rupauniversity.com to get access to all the previous sessions that we have done. But with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Bas Bahar Esmali. Dr. Asmali grew up in Iran and immigrated to the United States when she was 20 years old to pursue her dream of becoming a doctor. Since graduating with honors from the University of Colorado School of Dental Medicine in 2009, she has completed numerous advanced continuing education courses in the fields of craniofacial pain, TMJ disorder, and airway development, and currently focuses her clinical practice on the connection between oral and whole body health. She holds the prestigious position of being one of 24 North American consultants with 3M as part of the Council of Innovative Dentistry. She also serves as a member of the Educational Committee at American Academy of Cranial Facial Pain. More than just a practitioner, she is a passionate educator and goes out of her way to help her patients understand the why behind the what of the issues for which they are seeking help. She is a certified personal trainer specializing in posture correction and is passionate about interconnectedness of the human body from head and neck posture to jaw joint alignment to facial muscle uh, tonicity to gait. In light of her profound realization that straight teeth cannot function on crooked faces, she is on a mission to enlighten practitioners on their ability to impact compens compensatory mechanisms that ultimately lead to the breakdown of our bodies and our health. Be sure to check out her new website, airwayarchitect.com. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Ismali. I will go ahead and let you take it from here. Well, thank you so much, Adrian, for that wonderful presentation. Um, I'm just so excited to see the number of attendees and the number of people that have signed up for this webinar. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here with everybody and um, get started. But uh, I, I tell you, this subject has a very special uh, place in my heart because that's really the direction that I started taking as I shifted my clinical dentistry three years ago. In the works, just um, as you mentioned, I've been a dentist for about 14 years now. For the last four years, I have realized one thing. As a practitioner of the mouth and the teeth, there is no way I continue what I was doing if I was just focused on mouth and the teeth. Because practically, the body that owns the teeth and the mouth is really what's determining the fate of them. It was impossible for me to do what I did without learning how the body functions. So I'm hoping that during this next um, 45 to 50 minutes, I can bring you guys the gist of what I have learned. And I saw a lot of my peers and DDS in here. I'm just so excited to share that with you guys. Before we get started, I would love to make a quick disclaimer here that the information that I'm about to present here is just for your educational entertainment purpose, and it should not be used for diagnostic purposes exclusively. And I do not have any affiliation with any products or uh, websites that I'm about to present. So with that said, I know we have all different um, initials after our names. I've saw MDs and DDS and practitioners and my functional therapists, chiropractors, PTs perhaps in here, and maybe even patients and parents. But there is one universal law that I think applies to all of us as humans and practitioners to understand how the body works. Our bodies were not meant to heal. It was meant and built to survive from the minute of conception to birth and until the last breath that we take, our brain and our bodies are meant for surviving. Environment provide us with challenges and resistance for us to meet that resistance to grow. That's the purpose. It's when that equilibrium is not functional that instead of thriving, we become dysfunctional. And our jobs as a practitioners and partnering with our patients is to help their body heal removing the compensation that make it survive so it can get to healing. 
Most of our um, MDs and um, functional medicine practitioner and holistic and biological dentists are familiar with this. This diagram, it looks a little bit busy, but in all the gist of it is talking about when the body is being presented with stressors, we have adaptive capa capacities biologically at so many different levels, physiological and neurological, um, orthopedic, even mentally to deal with those stressors. The Equilibrium between the adaptive capacity and the stressors really going to determine either we are in a health or disease stage. So a lot of the chemicals that are being produced in the body and creating a lot of uh, chronic conditions all are a are consequence of body that has lost its balance of the stress to not being able to cope up, which is the adaptive capacity. So allostasis, what is really allostasis? The allostasis is the state of body being able to handle the stress that's being put upon it. But what really has happened the last few years, and I'm going to say about 200 years, we've modernized. Modernization is root of all those stressors that our body's being presented with that leads to compensation. We do need to have challenges to meet. We were born asymmetrical in our body just so that we can meet the demand of propelling to one side or another, meet with a walk. But when that asymmetry is being met with challenges that doesn't let it propel and survive, then now we have dysfunction. So some of those modernization that is not working for us, let me list a few of them. And believe me, the list is way longer than this, but I'm just going to put a few in here. High cortisol amniotic fluid in the womb. Let's start from conception. We think the epigenetic challenges that start after birth, quite wrong. Children are not able to move in the womb. Moms are not able to be the actual host for the child. They have to carry jobs and cortisol productions, food, environment, lack of sleep, air-conditioned rooms, name the few. Even just the level of stressor factors in family conditions is causing the, the child that's developing in the womb to not have what it takes to mobility, the growth and development that it needs. Trauma during birth. Let's talk about that child that's not ready to go through the delivery and come into this world, that first breath. Suction delivery, C-section, breached babies, just to name a few, are some of the traumas that are causing the, the skull and the alignment of the body from the first breath not to be in coherent state. And then extend in time in the car seat. Children were supposed to roll, uh, crawl, and do all of those movements, but the extended amount of time that they were sitting in the bouncers and car seats are debilitating their bodies. The senses that need development, going from brainstem to midbrain, that stage of life is so sensitive for them they need the challenges for their senses to develop, but instead they're being confined to car seats and jumpers and artificial environment that doesn't challenge their development of senses. Insufficient breastfeeding, tongue tightness, which is a huge subject in dentistry and dental facial development. Rubber shoes on hard floors. Let's talk about that. One of the most important senses for our motor development and autonomic nervous system function is our sensation of ground under our feet and how we handle gravity as bipedal animals. But we're walking on floors that are even. It does not let our bodies challenge its uneven bilateral system. On top of that, we're putting rubber shoes on children that basically challenges the stability and the sensation of the ground. Humans were meant to be walking barefoot on uneven grounds and riding on horses, climbing boulders, not sitting in chairs in front of screens in convergence styles within walls. Speaking of modern homes, which I call them sensory deprivation chambers. We have 30 degree of lordosis in our head and rotation of our head and neck, just so that we can develop our sense of vision, sensation of our skin, hearing, sight, outside with the horizon. But instead, we're confined to the walls and screens. That convergence is demanding on our system and it's debilitating for development of senses of right and left from hearing senses, um, even even uh, contact of our teeth. So the midbrain development is heavily challenged as well. And then the artificial food. Most of my um, functional medicine doctors in here are very familiar with side effects of all the processing foods, uh, the uh, chemicals that are being put in food just for the sake of making it available and transition it from one state to another. Uh, food that's available when they're not in season. I should not even be talking about this because I'm the least expert, but just touching up on the soft food itself and how it relates to the dentist. Not having enough texture and chewing ability in the food for children, food that melts in their mouth from cereal to food that are meshed up and pureed, it does not challenge the facial and growth development muscles that are required for chewing and function, which we're going to get to what the side effect of that would be. Nonverbal communications. 
there's no talking and sound. Kids are not using full words anymore. They're just constantly on their phones. And the challenge for the throat, which is one of the most important airway muscles, the tongue itself, it doesn't develop. So there is no challenge on the system to meet the demand and grow. And then chemical stresses. There is no shortage of air conditioned rooms, toxicity from mold to allergenics to 5G networks. I mean, there's lists that goes on and I'm just, just touching it up in a few. I mean, if I just leave that in here and ask you, what is, going to, what is going to happen to a body that's ready to grow, yet every turn that it takes, it has to adapt something that's foreign to it. And that what brings me to the allostatic load. So think about the stress levels and down here and what the body does with that stress. It was meant to adapt and to grow us, to make us human beings with full function. But instead, when the stress level is way too high, there is levels of exhaustion and fatigue and breakdown instead of adaptation in favor. This is a straight from Wikipedia, by the way. In my simple definition, allostatic load simply means what can the body take before it break? So what do the modern disease have all in common? I'm going to use the word dysautonomia, but just to break it down, it's basically a state of dysfunctioning autonomic nervous system. Autonomic nervous system in our subconscious basically in our background determines at any given moment with the information that are provided from our senses, hearing, skin, vision, sense of touch, uh, temperature, everything in our environment, am I safe or not safe? And it would decide whether we should be in rest or digest or fight or flight. And when that balance is ticked a little into fight or flight because the challenges and the stresses are too much, we have a state of this autonomia that's geared into more of a sympathetic drive. So for that matter, the autonomic, the uh, parasympathetic branch, which is rest and digest, is going to suffer a little bit. And that leads to inflammation. When, auto when sympathetic nervous system is turned on and is never turned off, there's going to be consequences. Every time a breaker goes off, every time the alarm system goes off or a 911 call is made, something is going to happen. And when body is constantly in that inflammation zone, in that dysautonomia stage, because it doesn't have what it takes to adapt and thrive, that's when we see disease process, which is what I call a sympathetic mode term, permanently turned on. And it's not much is done to turn it back off. One of the most important ones that we're not talking about is correcting the autonomics through posture, breathing, nutrition, and all the like. Here's what I see when I see a patient. And I'm sure you guys are familiar with this. If you're a practitioner of holistic medicine, you probably are seeing and asking questions. Patients come in with this symptoms, neck pain nasal congestions, poor concentrations, headache, fatigue, high blood pressure, snoring, diabetes, overweight, allergic to everything, hormone imbalances, mouth breathing, poor sleep quality. If you ask the question, these are usually the yeses that show up in the medical system. Well, what do we do to solve the problem? These are not isolated conditions. These are all conditions that are related to the whole system dysfunction. What we need is a paradigm shift of looking at the whole system 11 systems that are meant to function together to bring one body to resist and to adapt and to grow for function. And that's the most difficult task for scientific community to accomplish because we're given balls, we're given titles, we're given boxes that we have to fit within in our diagnostic process. How I see it, every puzzle needs to be solved with the big picture. We need to know what the big picture looks like. And then we have to find borders and corners. Without that, we're basically trying to fit the pieces together and shoot in the dark. And the most important thing in the whole process of solving the puzzle is remaining unbiased. If a symptom comes to you and it's not in the area that you are the expert, having that big picture and knowing that some pieces may not fit together is important. I'm going to bring you the example. As a dentist treating TMJ, and that was my specialty for about four years, every single symptom that was related to the temporal mandible joint has something to do with the rest of the body, with the spine, hip structure. And most of those patients had a lot of common denominators, clenching and grinding, lack of good sleep, high blood pressure. Some of them actually, most of them had ADHD medications, poor concentrations, poor quality sleep, dysbiosis, indigestions. It's impossible to overlook and see the common denominators in a systemic way. And I was not able to address them because my title says you are a dentist. Treating a condition in isolation never works. And you continue, and I continue to remain unbiased until I remove the box and I start seeing the whole big picture. And boy, is it making it easier to treat the patients. 
And I just want to make a quick disclaimer. I don't believe in treatment. I only believe in decompensation. And that was a challenge right here. There is no IC decoding for what we do. We want to heal the patient. We want to restore homeostasis. But the international coding of diagnostics has it. M's and S's and L's after every diagnostic code. And depending on your specialty, you need to stay within the codes that you're assigned. But that's not how body works. So first objective, that's the first part of our diagnostic process. What's the challenge there? This is limited by the letters after the doctor's name. As a dentist, I have a hard time explaining to third-party payers why I need to get um, information regarding digestive tract and imply that. And this is outside of your scope. If I want to know about their hip, this, you know, malalignment, that's outside of my scope. Yet, all of those are going to affect my diagnostic decisions and what I'm going to do to make my patient feel better. The objective. This is completely limited by the third-party payer and connected to the first one. Again, the problem of letters after doctor's name carries over. I cannot um, describe, prescribe a home sleep test. I'm not an MD. I cannot take a CT scan if I don't have enough justification for a medical purpose. I cannot order a blood work because that's outside of my scope. But then assessment, this is a debriefing. And there's at least three or four doctors to decode what's going on with those two information we already gathered. If we do not have enough information from subjective and objective, and we have limitations, and we have no communications with our peers, how are we ever going to be able to diagnose our patients to help them with what they need as a protocol? This is not planned. In my opinion, P in the SOAP is protocol. Who does with what, when, and how? And that, to me, this is the most important step of the diagnostic step. Because a protocol, you do the wrong treatment, right treatment at the wrong step, you're still going to end up with the right treatment. If the body is breaking down and compensating from an ascending standpoint from ground up, dentists can easily disrupt that process by putting something in a patient's mouth. Knowing where the diagnostic conditions are coming from, knowing where the symptoms are related to is that much more important to start a patient with the right protocol, with the right step. And I think we should cut this in half. I think the patients should be in charge of what's subjective and what's objective. I think the doctors should not be limited in terms of gathering the information. And when it comes to assessment and plan, there should be a collaboration, which is one of the reasons why I actually chose Rupa to come and do this presentation, because one of the most amazing things they've done is bringing all diagnostic tests on the same roof, allowing the patient to gather the information, making it available to all practitioners alike so that it helps them with the diagnostic process. And if we can join forces all alike, this would be an easy puzzle to, set, to solve. So let me bring the perspective of a dentist from a craniofacial and dental orthopedic to those folks that are not familiar with it. And if you're a dentist and you're eager to learn more, I would love to have a chat with you about it because this realization changed my career. We are living in the more life uh, in the era of genetically modified food and epigenetically modified humans. Look at the skull of a human being. This is a 200 year old skull, broad arch, 32 teeth, no orthodontic snippet. The nostrils are giant. The eye sockets, I mean, the symmetry, the cells have the massive jaw. It's meant for chewing, meant for developing open airways, breathing. And look at the skull of a human. This is a modern skull, not, does not belong to an alien. This is actually a child in my practice right now. I mean, looking at the faces of humans that are shrinking and becoming more and more asymmetrical. The brains are getting bigger and faces are getting smaller. The passage of air through the face, which is the front portion of our skull, is getting much more dysfunctional, again, from the moment of conception through the birth, through going through the birth canal, and all the compensations that I just listed, soft fruit and lack of development is all contributing to what is known to be modified, epigenetically modified humans that do not function properly. So why am I even talking about breathing? Because every breath is depending on 22 bones in our skull and three bones at the base of our head. The movement of these bones together with every diaphragmatic breathing is going to push the spinal fluid around the brain in a movement called flexion and extension, which is basically a very subtle movement of these bones together to push through the spinal fluid around the brain and spinal cord. Cerebral spinal fluid is the essence of health. It's what carries the blood, um, pardon me, nutrients and oxygens, basically to the brain and spinal cord, removing the waste and lymphatic drainage. What happens if this does not work properly? 
if the uh, cerebrospinal fluid does not function and, and remove the waste from the brain, and that's a toxic buildup, and we know what that actually does. This, in essence, is called primary respiration. So disordered breathing, lack of diaphragmatic breathing, and dysfunction in orientation of all this 22 bones in the skull and the three on the bottom of the spine, which is the ilia, the two ilia and the sacrum that support it, is what's causing the respiration and breathing to be in sync. So when we have crooked bones in the skull, crooked faces, malaligned bones, what's going to happen is we're going to have a slight disruption in that system, as I just explained. What it's going to do then, causing this autonomia, like I said, the brainstem is always aware of what's going on in the body. And when functions are not properly done and the brain is not getting the right amount of oxygen and is loaded with toxicity, that's causing eruption of the, or activation of the sympathetic nervous system, which basically that leads to inflammation. That is the first response for the body is activating what is going to be an emergency response expanding energy, reducing in functions and state of alertness. Nothing good comes out of a sympathetic nervous system that's chronically on. We do need sympathetic nervous system to activate it when we are in danger. In fact, when a tiger is truly chasing you to run for your life. But when the tiger either catches you and going into a freeze mode or you escape the tiger, you're gonna to have to go back to parasympathetic stage, which is ventral vagal or rest and digest. Unfortunately, there is no tiger chasing us. We're being responsive to an environment that's ever challenging our nervous system. I listed 11 of them. From our food to the environment, we're constantly being challenged so that allopathic load is completely exhausted and fatigued. And instead of going back to rest and digest, we're operating in a sympathetic nervous system mode. So what are some of those compensations? First one is the posture, the form. Head needs to stay over the hip and over the base of the support, which is the feet. And when we're not able to make those functions happen, posture will suffer. And the negative impact on the spine is directly reflected in diaphragmatic breathing or lack thereof for that matter. Chest breathing is one of the most devastating thing that has happened to modern humans and mouth breathing is connected with it. Cerebral spinal fluid, I already talked about that. Malaligned skull and hip does not allow the movement of the spinal fluid and all the important functions to go with it. And the functional compensations, breathing. Breathing when it was meant to be from the nose to the diaphragm. That is the essence of health. But unfortunately, mode of operation is from mouth to the chest. And respiration suffers. When we're mouth breathing, we're basically exhaling way too much CO2 outside the system. And CO2 is what regulates the pH. And if the pH is not at the proper range, which is 7.45, we're recapturing the oxygen in the lung. Now we're going to have a condition called desaturation. That's what we see a lot of times in our mouth breathers and home sleep studies. And that's just one of the ways that our body's being affected by mouth breathing. I'm not even going to go into details of minerals deficiencies and how the CO2 is restored, but I'm just giving you guys an overview and understanding how our health is being directly impacted by the way we're breathing and how our breathing is directly impacted by just our alignment in our orthopedics, which is something that we do on this other side of the aisle in physical medicine and dental orthopedics. So I'm gonna start with my why. I love sharing this because uh, this is my little girl, Melody. Melody, I'm going to make it a concise story of how I actually got to understanding of all of this when I was not aware of any of the information I just presented to you guys. My daughter was suffering from all those symptoms. And this is the modernization that affected my health as much as your children and your patients. If you can take a quick look at her, the jaw is shifted to one side and her head is completely twisted counterclockwise. The picture on the right side is after I found the right way to treat her. Between these two pictures, there's three years difference. I had seen five board certified specialists, two orthodontists, two ENTs, and a sleep pulmonologist, double board specialist that recommended removing her adenoids and tonsils amputating body parts just because they were doing their job right. And if I tell you that not one of those five practitioners actually asked a question about her breathing dysfunction, it will blow your mind. And that's exactly what happened when I had to fix and treat and address the actual malalignment and breathing dysfunction. The face had all the clues, but they all missed it. So when I looked in her mouth, this is what, for those folks that are not dental, the cross bite, teeth grinding, vertical growth, Crowding, early stage of crowding, 
position of the head, lumbar spine posture, this child's body was a screaming for help. And not one asked the question, let's treat the symptoms, let's treat the symptoms. Yes, when the large uh, tonsils are enlarged, they're going to close off the airway. But the better question is before we amputate them, or ever for that matter, how do they get enlarged in the first place? And that's the picture of her airway. This is right behind her tongue, and the space was limited in the adenoid enlargement, posture of her neck. And there was no question about how to address the cause. And then everybody was attempting to reduce the symptoms. And this is how she slept every night, with her mouth propped open, sleeping on her side. And these are lists of symptoms. She had every single ADHD symptoms, weak immune system. She would get sick and would be sick for a month, waking up at night terrors, poor concentration, couldn't sit still, sugar cravings, which caused dysbiosis, gut issues, um, a lot of candidiasis in her gut, loud snoring. AHI was 10 at age five after a demand at home sleep or lab sleep test. She was not getting sufficient REM sleep, which is uber important for children in growth stage for brain development, for memory restorations, and growth hormones, snoring, all of them. So why am I so com compassionate about nasal breathing and bring it into the forefront? And I'm sure most of you guys know about it because lack of nasal respiration, whether being from an orthopedic and passage of the nasal passages and um, oral space that's limited or inflammation. When body's not getting filtration through the nose, all the allergens enter the mouth and all the soft tissues get enlarged. Just one of the ways that inflammation can cause closing of the airways. Not the only one, but just one. And then there's autonomic disruption. When we're not able to breathe through our nose, that automatically put the nervous system into a sympathetic ear. And the posture shifts to adapt to the only way that we can breathe, which is mouth breathing. That causes symmetry, disruption, torsion in much of the spine and dura matter that supports it. And that leads to loss of function. So I'm just going to give a quick example of that. When a head goes into a forward posture, chest has to cave in, go backwards, and the pelvis goes in a forward motion. The curvature in the spine is going to suffer. Now we have loss of mobility in different segments of the spine, which each one of them had some primary function. Upper cervicals is usually related to, um, cause, is causing headaches. I know a lot of lumbar spine is related to indigestions, liver function, kidney function. So in body's attempt to fix the first problem of breathing, which was narrow passage of airway, now we have a second problem of indigestion and no normal function of the hormones. We haven't even talked about the HPA axis compromise, hypothalamus, pituitary gland, and growth hormone that gets affected because of disruption of sleep. And that's disease. Disease is a state of body that is not able to meet the demand and is basically breaking as it's compensating and overcompensating and is exhausting its adaptive capacity. This is where I bring it home. Symmetry versus asymmetry. Here's a picture I'm going to put in here and ask everybody. Which one of these guys is in homeostasis and balance? And your answer should be both. The only difference is one of them has to work way harder to maintain that state. And we know one of them is going to be less tolerant of any changes that we put on it. If I challenge the guy on the left side with putting a, you know, a weight or a leg or something on one side, he can recapture his balance very quickly. And he doesn't have to spend so much energy to keep and maintain that state versus the guy on the left on the right side. That's finance stage. It's working double hard, taxing the autonomic nervous system just to remain that balance. And if one quick change is introduced to that system, it's not able to quickly adapt to it because it's already in adaptive capacity overload. So we already established asymmetry equals disruption in flow and function. So goal is to restore symmetry. First, orthopedically. We know that a lot of orthopedic conditions can lead to orthopedic malalignment, whether being in the skull, in the mouth, in the face, the spine, hip, and posture all alike it's going to cause some physiological adaptation. So restoring the orthopedic symmetry makes sense with the goal of breathing and respiration being in sync. When we're diaphragmatically breathing, diaphragm descends and it causes intrathoracic pressure to increase. As a result, we're gonna have increased pressure inside the head. So the bones in the head need to completely go into a motion of um, flexion and extension to create pressure or room for that um, pressure inside the skull. Otherwise our skull is going to, our brain is going to get um, pressure on it. And if those bones are malaligned, that function is gonna suffer. So bringing the breathing respiration in sync with the bones in the head is super important. 
re basically restoring the primary motions of the body, reducing physiological stress for adaptation, and increasing adaptive capacity. That all equals homeostasis in a nutshell, which is the sky. We all agree. When we are able to breathe without compromise physically, uh, neurologically, orthopedically, physiologically, we're going to have a much better state of health. So the green. For those that golf understand, there's a green zone. And I've only golfed once to understand the game. The golf has a green zone and goal is to get the ball in the pot, in the cup. And if the ball is in the cup, the game's over. But we want to, if the ball is hundreds and hundreds of yards away from the green, and sometimes it's stuck in a sandbox, what are the tools and what are the things we need to bring it back to the green? So looking at this too, by the way, these are two, both of them are my children. And like I said, my kids, as much as every kid's in your practice, even your children, if you're a parent here and hearing this, you probably look at your child and you say, I could see that. I could see my child is standing on one side. Their hip is going forward or they're carrying their head in a, in a, in a one-sided way. The green line that I just draw here, it's actually part of the posture screen app, which I love using. When we are, um, when we're looking at the body from top of the head to the bottom of the feet, there is a green line of homeostasis that when the body is aligned with that, when the three triangles of head, torso, and the pelvis are in alignment with each other, the, the functions of autonomics are at optimal. But when the body is, for whatever reason, is shifted outside of that, now we have a state of dysautonomia. So creating homeostasis equals health, and that's not the same as highly medicated. So I believe heavily that posture is our most available objective measure to evaluate the autonomic function. So I gathered all the information that I have done for the last four years and concised it into this rule of three Bs that I called every breath needs brain and balance. So think about the human body. From the minute we stand up as bi bipedal animals, our feet hit the ground, we have so many joints and muscles and they need to align each themselves to organize the head on top of the cervical spine. And that's the goal. So think about three triangles, hip, torso, and our skull that need to be lined up and organized on top of each other. So the first response or the first reason why body's out of alignment is to make sure the breathing happens. At any given moment, the most important reflex that's determining our posture or postural changes or compensations breathing reflex. Then is the balance. We need to retain the cerebral spinal fluid, cranial bones, maxilla, eyes with the horizon with every swallow. And as we're propelling, the brain needs to stay with the center of gravity. We do understand there's forward head posture, but what does the forward head posture really mean? I mean, there is so many different ways we can slice and dice what a forward head posture really indicate. Um, if you talk to a psychologist, they probably relate that to the state of depression. Chiropractors think it's an ergonomic conditions. And if you're a dentist treating upper airway resistance, it's related to the lack of oral space and tongue impinging on the airway and pushing the head forward. In any way, the brain needs to remain over the center of gravity. So if the compensation of the forward head posture is already assumed, we can't just bring the head back over to the, to the shoulders and the cervical spine without addressing why it happened in the first place. Is it a breathing problem and a balance? And in that order, we need to address them. This is really interesting because what we're looking at humans that lived 100 years and beyond, they have this one thing in common, symmetry. So can we say that creating symmetry should be on top of our list? So let me now start making it a little bit more interesting, sharing some of the cases. Um, in the interest of time and our mix of audience, I'm not going to go into the details of what happened, but all the cases that I'm going to show here are dental orthopedics that I have done last two years. And this young lady is one of the uh, best cases that I have treated, perhaps because of not only her eagerness to comply and going through the motions, but the syntax that was created. And if you look at the two, these two pictures are about 15 months apart, and there's a multitude of treatments with an upper cervical chiropractor, SOT chiropractor, sacral occipital techniques, um, myself with a dental orthopedics and arch development, oral myofunctional therapy um, alike in the right syntax to create this beautiful face. She's beautiful in both, we all agree, but we know when there's symmetry, there's attraction to that because symmetry equals beauty equals function. And that's her profile when we finish the case. We know when there's functional um, discomfort in the body, when there is a need to compensate for something that's lacking somewhere else, there is going to be level of postural 
compensation that's right in front of you. Every patient you look at, I want to hope that you can step back, look at the way they're holding their head, look at the, whole, the way they're holding their shoulders, uneven shoulders and head that are shifted to one side or another, arm not propelling when walking, they all mean something. Here's another young lady that I have treated, and this was about a two-year process. And looking at the oral development and what it did to actually address the breathing dysfunction and working with the right practitioners, just a few millimeters of oral space and arch development has created a tremendous amount of comfort in her breathing. And here's the actual change that happened in her spine, which does in fact reflect the curvature and function that was restored in the upper cervicals and how she's supporting her head and jaw. And there is a probably a three hour webinar I can talk about position of the mandible and the cervical spine that actually can directly impact and bring the patient into parasympathetic state. Here's another young man. I actually enjoyed treating him because in the span of one year, he actually changed so much. And from the excitement to go to school, the ADHD, some of the symptoms that I was exhibiting to demeanors and the social engagement, quality of sleep, breathing has changed tremendously. I'm going to go ahead and show some of the details again, some non-dental folks here. Drawing a line between the earlobes, um, you can see some of the rotation of the head that has been addressed, position of the cervical spine and the skull that has improved, and looking at the um, dimension of the face improvement, which directly shows mandible is in a much better homeostasis with the neck, and where the uh, occlusion lies below the line from ear to ear, which speaks volume about symmetry in the face. And looking at the two maxillas, and we have two, one on the right and one on the left, and how the midline was completely shifted, and one side of the skull was completely dropping down. And by the end of the treatment, a lot of that was addressed. And looking at the eyes, which tell a lot of the story, once we put the cranial bones and the bones in the head in the correct place and they function properly, a lot of nerves that control the eye movements also relax. So when we're looking at our patient's eyes, one of the things I look at, not just the diameters of the pupil or the size of the pupil, but also looking at the expression and looking at how relaxed his face is, the, the posture of the head. And this one, you cannot get over how much better the actual skull is sitting on top of upper two cervicals. So in a nutshell, this is the state of allostatic load overload. Jaw going to one side, maxilla is already shifted, eyes are squandering, and there's trouble in this face. I mean, this is not an effortless smile. Versus here, symmetry restoration, dialing down the sympathetic and dropping down some of those physiological responses to that sympathetic overdrive, digestive issues, ADHD, lack of good sleep, lack of engagement in school, and, and just all alike. Why medicate when we can actually decompensate? <clears throat> this is a picture I borrowed from the um, um, Portland TMJ clinic. And wanted to show the progression of the changes in the upper cervical spine when the skull is malaligned, especially the mandible, from this picture to that picture. That's a good visualization. Here's another amazing lady. When she came to see me about two years ago, the thickness of her medical history was about an inch, and she had done most of what the RUPA testing offers, and nobody could figure out what's going on. And the answer was right straight in the way she was holding her neck, and the way she was, her mouth was treated. And orthodontics didn't do anything for her. I'll get to show you some of the pictures from inside her mouth. Practically, anyone can look at this and see that the ears are shaped from her face, the expression of the eyes, the posture of the neck, and how she's holding herself and how she's actually relating and, and, and able to relate to the, to the world. And that's what happens inside the mouth with the orthopedic development. We can actually see how much more volume in the mouth there is. And this is non-surgical treatments with just oral removable oral appliances over a period of six, 12 to 16 months. Yet again, another amazing patient I treated, and she became a grandmother for the second time during the course of this treatment and excited to be around her grandkids. You can't get over how asymmetrical the face is in here. Hearing aids are speaking volumes about potential neuropathy that's attached to malalignment of the bones. And restoring the symmetry, again, it took four providers in the right syntax to bring her home. And this is what happens when you're restoring symmetry, increasing oral volume, addressing the function first. And that's actually another picture. Again, I'm trying to um, not make it too dental for my non-dental folks here. And that's the actual result of her sleep test. So AHIs that would render and qualify her for CPAP. And within a year, she's practically in a normal range. 
Can we do more? Yes. But you can breathe. We can all agree. So here's my take-home message, and glad we're staying on time. Number one goal that I have, and I hope that you guys share that with me, is breathing effortlessly. That is the first goal, to get our patients to breathe without compensation, without sympathetic drive. Nose to diaphragm. Removing the block in the chain, anything that's interfering with breathing that happens without compensation, because we want to increase their allostatic load so they can deal with the stresses that life brings to them, not have to overdo, not have to overexhaust their adaptive capacity for what should be already free for them, which is breathing. Restoring symmetry, correcting the posture, and that is directly reflected by autonomic nervous system function. So hopefully less sympathetic, more parasympathetic, less tax in the system, increasing the energy reservoirs, increasing adaptive capacity. I'm sure I sound like a broken record at this point, um, but this is every turn I, every corner I turn, this is what I see. Three corners to our health, orthopedic and neurology, physiology, and for that matter, mental, emotional health. And if you're not carrying all three of those together as practitioners, we are leaving some for our patients to compensate again, and it becomes a vicious cycle. Turning off the inflammation, the digestive hormones, respirations, and pH all could be restored. It takes a team. And yes, we want them to sleep better too. And as a matter of fact, when we are able to, to do these procedures together, we can address what's causing disruption in the sleep from many angles, not just one. So remember, as functional practitioners, first, cure sometimes, relief often, and comfort always. Let's help humans do life better. I really appreciate all you guys taking 45 minutes to an hour of your time today to spend with me. I truly enjoy um, bringing this information to a lot of groups, especially the ones that are not dentists, because I know that there's a bridge to be built. So I really appreciate your time and attention here. If you have any questions, you want to reach out to me, this is my personal email. And as Adrienne shared with you guys earlier, my personal website is airwayarchitect.com. Um, with that said, Adrienne, let's bring on the questions. Dr. Smalley, amazing presentation. I don't think I've seen uh, so much uh, just love coming through the chat during a, a presentation. So thank you for taking the time uh, and putting all these slides together for us. Such an important, and I feel like uh, not well known topic, or at least not well covered topic within just general functional medicine. So thank you for, for again, joining us today. So popping right into the question, um, and for folks, if you have any questions, please use that Q&A button. I see a ton more flooding in right now. Use that Q&A button and we'll go ahead and get through as many as we can. Um, but what do you think about the connection between TMJ, teeth grinding, and the silent acid reflux? Huge. That's actually one of the topics that are being now covered and addressed in much of dental sleep medicine. So just to briefly bring a, I hope I can make it concise enough. So sure. when you're having any trouble with keeping the airway open, an airway is right behind the tongue and soft palate. When, when we were breathing during sleep and the breathing is disrupted because the airway collapses, that's what uh, obstructive sleep apnea is about. That's what breathing dysfunction is during sleep episodes of obstruction because of the collapse of a floppy tissue. That negative pressure in the attempt to open the airway is going to basically create a backflow of the acidic stomach flow to come back up. And it does irritate the esophageal area, making patients prone to um, esophageal cancers and erosion of a lot of their teeth if they have so many recurrent episodes. Grinding teeth, there's so many different um, ideologies and theories out there, which one of them is... Um, the trigeminal reflex, which to explain what that is, when you're having an episode of obstruction of you know, airway that puts the body into a sympathetic drive, the oxygen drops, the brain is not what gets what it needs, activates a sympathetic drive, and to bring it back to sympathetic, parasympathetic, the body uses clenching because muscles of the face through trigeminal nerve are geared to parasympathetic activity. So clenching is one of the ways to bring the heart rate back down from a tachycardia to bradycardia. And um, another theory, which I'm not really huge fond of, is they, they believe that clenching and grinding is going to open up the airway. I have no scientific reason to say one way or another, but I do know clenching and grinding is one way that body's attempting to move the spinal fluid and opening the cranial patterns. That I do believe that to be the case, because a lot of my patients, when they're when I do address their malalignment in their skull, some of the clenching and grinding stops, especially when the mandible assumes a more neutral um, position for responsive to reflexes of breathing, um, keeping the cranium in neutrality. So crunching and grinding, 
the acid reflux, especially, especially in children, heavily related. To yeah, children. absolutely. Thank you. What's your recommendation for proper breathing through the nose? And in, in this scenario here is both their kids are mouth breathers when they sleep. Oh gosh, <clears throat> mouth breathing in children, it's it's an epidemic we need to really take seriously, need to be addressed. Uh, depending on the age of children, again, obstruction could be either because of physiological obstruction, which basically means, I'm gonna give an example. Do we have a narrow hallway or a narrow hallway and packed up with boxes? Because you could remove the inflammation physiologically. And I know Rupa has so many different testing that could be done, GI mapping, um, looking at inflammation biomarkers, C-reactive protein, seeing what, what are the white blood cells that are high and why they have inflammation. Reducing the inflammation, which going back to say, why are we removing the tonsils? They get enlarged for a reason. If the body is in a constant inflammation, what is causing it? And addressing that, sometimes, believe it or not, it could be psychological as well. So addressing the inflammation at its core and turning it off and taking it to its full cycle is number one. But evaluating the actual architecture of the airway. Do they have a high arched palate? If you're looking at the child's mouth and their palate is high vaulted instead of being um, wide, if they're constantly breathing through their mouth with their mouth propped open, uh, audible breathing, <clears throat> sinus infections constantly, ear infections, um, we already touched on large tonsils, looking at back of throat, high mal body score. Those are signs that this kid's not breathing properly and they mm -hmm. can be addressed if they are diagnosed correctly. So orthopedic alignment, do they need growth and development? And it's different for a three-year-old at a newborn than it is the one in uh, mixed dentition in um, adolescent than it is for an adult to do it. But all the cases I showed you guys, I had treated adults and I grow their oral environment, oral space for the tongue with the right proper treatment. The question is not how, it's why. Once we know the why, it's easier to reverse engineer what we need to do to address. There we go. We got to find the root cause. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's why we're here. Yeah. Um, so this one is, and you actually answered the next follow-up question there. So I'll jump ahead to the next one. It is excellent presentation. Where should the tongue be when our mouth is closed? Proper posture, right at the roof of the mouth. As a matter of fact, Nobody should be hearing you breathe. Nobody should be seeing you swallow. So I'm gonna give it down. If you can all uh, locate the papilla, which is the small tissue right behind the two front teeth, mm -hmm. we're gonna call that spot. When you say the word N, like Nancy, what is the tip of the tongue called? That's the tip of, that's called the spot. That's where the tip of the tongue should be. Now, when the tip of the tongue is at the spot, the rest of the body of the tongue should be comfortably fitting and resting through the palate, which is the roof of the mouth. So if you have an obstruction, if you have a constriction of the mouth, which is called tongue, tongue tightness, restrictions in the frenum, it needs to be either stretched, trained, or released, which some providers, including myself and a lot of therapists that I work with, can do it. And if the mouth is too small and the tongue doesn't fit it, then the tongue automatically assumes a low posture because if the tongue doesn't fit the roof, the mouth is gonna have to sit low. And when it sits slow, you have to push your head forward to breathe. So that mm -hmm. kind of vicious cycle starts. So the tongue should be completely at the roof of the mouth at all times and nose should be the only route of breathing. You should only mouth breathe if you're needing to exhale too much CO2 because of metabolic buildup, because you're exercising or in a panic or sympathetic mode. But chest breathing and mouth breathing is absolutely a, a chronic disease that needs to be addressed. Super interesting. And I can promise that all 100 uh, plus people that are still here just put their tongues behind the, uh, yes. the top of the roof of their mouth. So thank you for that. Uh, where can you get a scan of your airways? You know, um, <clears throat> there are so many dentists that do airway dentistry. Like I said, for the purposes of this webinar, I cannot shout out to any particular institutions, but if you guys reach out to me directly, I can always in your zip code find someone who does have a proper C, not just having a CT, a CT scan with the right volume, but knowing how to take it properly. Because a lot of people, when they take the CT scan at oral surgeon office, they put the little um, a jig in, the, in between the teeth and it, and, it, and it heads forward, basically bring the patient to the machine and it completely changes the dynamic of that airway. But a lot of dentists do airway dentistry and uh, orthopedic development. We have so many of them all over the country. Um, they can do take it and they can help with the diagnostic process and functional medicine doctors. Definitely we can have um, you know home sleep tests and those tests available to you because I directly work with a lot of functional medicine doctors and their patients with ADHD and gut dysbiosis and HVA axis compromise what they do need is their airway opened up to breathe so they can regulate their thyroid and regulate their you know, cortisol and adrenals. So yes, please reach out. There's so many dentists out there you can work with. 
I love it. And you, of course, as you can see on the screen, can reach Dr. Smiley at airwayarc at gmail.com. Uh, next question. Do you have a preferred posture app and do you have one to suggest? I do actually. Posture, like, and I just, I did not put it in my presentation, but posture screen app, which I believe is one of the easiest ways parents can have it, practitioners can have it, dentists, chiropractors, um, most physical medicine use that. And what it comes with an augmented reality. So basically, you take a picture of the posture with the with the grids that are built into the app, and it will pick the positions of the shoulders, sternum, hip, and ears, and basically tells you, especially in the side picture, the effective weight of the head is 40 pounds. Well, the head that 40, if you have a bowling ball that weighs 40 pounds right here, your shoulder is going to give. So no yeah. wonder people have so much headaches and tensions in their neck because of that posture. So having that visual and having those numbers helps posture screen app is one of my favorites. I haven't used any other to make recommendations, but I'm sure if you're going to look at the you know, app store, but this one is annual uh, subscription you can get and you can get as many as you need. Amazing. Moving right on. Um, can misalignment of the jaw cause tinnitus? Yes, that is the one of the number one reasons patients come see me as a TMJ specialist is tinnitus. And I cannot tell you if I only would uh, give you a dollar every time I saw a tinnitus resolve after TMJ res resolution, I would, you would be wealthy. Because of the position of the condo, I want to go resort to my low hand and my skull here. So there's 22 bones, they do all move. And I'm so glad the mandible gave up because here's what I see the mandible. All these 22 bones are suturally connected, except this one. And this is not really a part of this. It's connection of the, and it's an extension, in my opinion, of our cervical spine. It's part of our cervical spine is connected to the hyoid bone, to the shoulder, and has a lot of reflexive functions. And this is how it fits into the skull. So this bone right here called temporal bone, it fits the temporal bone and it articulates with the teeth like that. The other structure that is housed in the temporal bone is your ear canal, ear balance center. So position of these, so right here is our ear canal. If the mandible, the lower jaw is pushed back because the head is in a forward posture or the cranium is in more of a inhalation, stuck in an inhalation, trauma from birth, trauma in any stage or just you know going through the birth canal, never having it addressed can potentially cause that. We'll push, push the mandible against that wall. And imagine every time that you swallow, the teeth come together, mandible has to assume its position between two condyles. And you don't have to move your right hip if you're moving your left hip. But when you move your jaw mandible here, both of these two have to adapt to it. So if one is pushed back because the skull is malaligned or crooked, the, 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 the head of the mandible is going to bang against that um, um, you know, ear canal. And it basically is like that noisy neighbor. Imagine 700 times a day, that's, I think that's the stats we swallow. It's basically causing that. So yes, proper position of the temporal bones and mandible tremendously affects tinnitus and balance, where to go, those symptoms. Amazing. And I'm going to pre-apologize. It sounds like UPS is here and my dogs, they're very protective. So if you hear a little bit of barking in the background, everything... we're not hearing anything, Adrian. Yeah, perfect. Uh, so the next question we have, uh, mouth taping. So yes. if someone is mouth taping, is it, uh, and it's been really helping, but not something they want to do forever uh, due to some skin irritation and probably some other reasonings, what do you recommend for next steps? Well, I think uh, mouth taping is a good start as a diagnostic step for me, as much as it's therapeutic. So if you're responsive to it, go back to the question number, which one it was, Adrienne, see a dentist that's a specialized in your area, reach out to me and I'll find you one that can address why you're not breathing properly. Is it because your nose is inflamed? Is it a physiological condition? Or is it really truly a narrow constricted airway because of lack of growth and this bone's being constricted. So let's address why that is, root cause, and get you to breathe properly. And you have no idea how many patients with asthma have treated their breathing restored and never had to get an albuterol. How many wow. people stop snoring? And yes, we don't want you to live with plastics and tape for the rest of your life. But if you are responsive to tape, take that seriously and take it to heart knowing that something has to be done. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what are the removable oral appliances? And you mentioned this, but where can somebody find a practitioner regarding this? They're trying to find someone that realizes, uh, yeah, really realizes this to help the oral. Uh, basically, long story short, they need some help. Well, they do. And like I said, I would only trust with a well-trained dentist who knows how to treat um, dental orthopedics that works in conjunction with the rest of the practitioners. 
So this is a broad, broad answer, but again, reach out to me and I'll be more than happy to set you up with the proper. As a matter of fact, I can probably make available uh, home sleep testing for those that are interested. If they want to go see a doctor, I can find you some help. Um, take this seriously. And this offer is out there for you guys, because I, 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 this is what I have really spent a lot of time is trying to connect the dots. And uh, I collaborate with a lot of peers of myself across the country and mm -hmm. we can find you someone no matter where area you are at. Amazing. For adults that have narrow upper palate, what can be done to expand the palate without surgery? Well, um, you guys can go back and watch the few that I showed, um, removable oral appliances that can um, address the oral space. Basically, the, the appliances are worn about 10 to 12 hours on average on my hand, and the patients would wear it usually at night and during the night when we have, uh, you know, the growth hormones are higher and they, they have activation screws in the, in the appliances, which they turn the key every two weeks or so as we are aligning and developing the arch. I, they call it expansion. I love the arch development better because arch is where the tongue needs to rest. So think about the roof of your mouth as the floor of the nose. That's really the same bone that's holding our teeth, our maxilla is the floor of the nose. Most of the architecture of the nose is in the palate, which is the four bones, palate, and maxilla, which is the roof of our mouth. So the position of those are basically, or shape of them are directed by the tongue. During growth and development, including in the womb, the tongue was supposed to be placed at the roof and shape that. And a lot of reasons, I'm not gonna get into reasons why that some people think it's methylation effect, so much folic acid, trauma, anything that's causing the tongue tightness, basically that whole synthesis in the middle being so fused, causing the tongue not to do that. So basically a low tongue posture, this doesn't grow. That's one, one school of thought anyway. But again, the fact that some of these bones are formed in that position and they're not doing their primary respiration correctly can also be a contributing factor. One of the cases that I showed, the patient was born with a 24 millimeter across, like a really, or really small high palate that just never grew. So soft food has something to do with it. Low tongue posture has something to do with it. The actual cricket skull has something to do with it. And to get the right approach, we have to find out the why first. I keep saying the same thing. Why? Yes, can it happen? Sure. But why it happened in the first place? Because if the tongue was not mobile in the first place, we can give you the appliance. It's the tongue that needs to do the job. So it needs to be addressed in the right syntax, in the right order, and uh, need to be addressed. And I work heavily, closely with chiropractors. And my life is way easier when they are addressing the rest of the spine, the rest of the skull with me, and we get our patients breathing effortlessly and growing and developing their arches. Yeah, absolutely. And I know that we're just a couple minutes away from the hour. Dr. Ismaili is going to stick around and finish up a few last questions with us. But if you do have to jump at the top of the hour, no worries. As I mentioned at the beginning, we are recording this, so you'll get access to the recording within the next few days. We'll distribute it out, but you'll also be able to find it on rupauniversity.com. So. Continuing on, can you speak on deviated septum and if you've corrected it without surgery before? Actually, um, deviated septums, I don't, I don't hardly make a promise that it's going to go away um, with uh, treatment of the oral appliances. Have I seen it? Absolutely. I heart, I don't like to make definitive answers because to say that, yes, it's going to happen every time. As a matter of fact, one of the cases, if I can, not, I still have my share screen here. I'm going to go back to, um, okay, there we go. Oh, I didn't put that picture here. I apologize. I did not put that picture, but that's one of the ones that I actually corrected. The one slide that I needed, ironic. <laughs> um, I know, right? So I did actually, um, I have seen correction, not correction, but more like alignment. Deviated mm -hmm. septum is one of those things because again, I'm going to go back to my handy dandy skull. Here's the septum and it's connected to, and it's sitting right smack in the middle of this suture in the middle of the palate. So it's like a paper bone that's not attached to anything. It's sitting in the middle of a cartilage that goes across the middle of the palate. So if one maxilla is high, one side of the skull is shifted and one maxilla is high, there drags with it that bone that's sitting in the middle. That's your deviated septum. And majority of our nitric oxide production, air filtrations, humidifications happen, sinus clearage happens in the middle, which is back of the throat, back of the palate. That's where majority of our good stuff happens. And if the palate is off, that basically is going to make it difficult for the nose to get the benefit of nasal breathing. So correcting the cranium, putting it into more of a neutral and a balanced stage and bringing those two palates in the right uh, um, plane with the horizon, it does affect the nasal breathing. And correction is a, is a definitive term. It addresses the function. To me, and functional airway does not necessarily have to have an aesthetic measure to it. I hardly ever go by retroglossal space. 
it is a functional space. I've had people that their space necessarily didn't change much, but they're breathing comfortably. Their AHI has dropped. It, you know, they don't have episodes, at least from a breathing standpoint. So um, I would hardly ever say I can correct it, but have I seen it uh, not needing a surgery? Absolutely. But again, are we talking the one that the septum is kissing the while of the sinus, or is it just a minor deviation that could be even manually corrected? I think it's worth a shot. You know, I would exhaust any non-surgical holistic approach first. That's non-reversible, you know, because surgery is one and done. You can't reverse it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So this is a non-dentist question. Um, what did you do specifically to fix the asymmetry? Is there a common, more most common solution to this? I guess, like, what did, what did, what are your steps to it? So, um, symmetry is one of those things. Like I said, we're born with an asymmetrical torso, and that was by design. The rest of our body is supposed to be symmetrical because that's our propelling center of gravity. All of our organs are on the right side. We have a larger diaphragm on the right side. We have more volume of lung on the right side. That's where we all start. So our uh, body needs to recognize the left side, shift to the left side and, and harmoniously come back. And every step we take and propel, breathing needs to be coordinated with it. Basically, this it's almost like air that kind of moves in our body from our pelvis to our lungs to our sinuses. Um, everywhere there's air in our body, it's like tires of the car. So tires of the car, you know, the passenger rear side is lower air. You could see how that affects the alignment of the car and function of the car. You know, the alternating factor. I just learned some new terms from mechanics. It yeah, seems like is. cars also operate the same way, but it's a much I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Alternating factor. So basically symmetry is an alternation. And if your body is not using the left side and this is stuck on one side, it, it from the skull to the hip to the to the torso, you know, this asymmetry meant for a for a reason for us to develop symmetrically. I keep going back and saying we're walking on floors that are not that are symmetrical. We end up being asymmetrical because we don't have a challenge to develop and to go to the left side and take the benefits of both sides functioning. One of the ways that I address that is making sure that the hip can be stable because to me, hip is the tabletop and all this 22 bones and the spine is pretty much everything that's on top of the tabletop. If you have shims under the legs of the table and the table is unstable, it makes zero sense to move anything on the top. But once you have a stable base, now you can put those in order being manual with therapies like oral appliance therapies. Um, I have so many different holistic approach, a lot of craniosacral therapies, SOT chiropractors, my functional therapies, dental orthopedists can help with that. But until we have a system that knows how to manage and propel its locomotor and breathing functions from a diaphragmatic standpoint in an erect posture, it's basically giving body another chance to go two step forward, three step back which is regression, not progression. Um, this is where I see creating symmetry it requires working across the arch with physical and functional medicine alike. Great answer. Thank you. You're welcome. What was the name of that app one more time? Was it, was it? Posture screen. Okay. Beautiful. Yeah. And for those of you guys that'd like to uh, learn and know more, like I said, reach out to me directly um, for, you know, finding the proper chiropractor. I love source C doctors, S O R. I'm going to go ahead and put that in the chat box for Adrian. You can share that with everyone. Perfect. Source C.com. I do love their techniques. And this is one chiropractic technique that directly relates to what I do and what most, most of the dental orthopedic doctors do uh, to help align the body, skull, and the spine alike. And um, again, if you need to find a, a well trained dentist, reach out to me directly and I will find you somebody that can help you. Amazing. Last couple questions here. Uh, what age do you start working or uh, working on widening the the palate? I would say this is a really broad question, but birth is what I would like to start. We're waiting way too long to address them. If a child is not latching, they're already not developing. If you if they've missed that window, hopefully by the time they're two years old, hopefully before they get the six year molars, hopefully before they go through puberty. When puberty hits, we're working against the clock, and I have so many. 12 to 13 year olds in my practice where we have to know um bring the big guns because once the front of the face the maxilla butts against the rest of the skull we basically are locked into that asymmetry and dysfunction so the quicker we address it and quickly correct their posture we set them off to actually grow correctly if they we don't and we miss them they're 18 years old now we have to treat them like they are adults and most of my 12 13 year old plus are treated like they are adults so we um you know i don't use the word expansion i do develop their arch and 
almost 100% of my cases are done with non-rapid non -rapid development. I don't want the word expansion um, because we want to allow the body to move the bones where it needs to be. And those sutures need to get deposition with the bone and osteogenesis and all that good stuff. And if we are moving and turning those keys once every other day or once a day, we're not allowing the body to actually do what it's supposed to do. So I'm a huge believer of slow is the name of the game. We don't force the body to do what it's not meant to do. I have never done rapid expansion, all of those surgically implanted SARPs, MARPs, those systems. I think that I've had much better results when I work with the body and they retain it. And the, the, the functional creation, it assures that the body knows how to do it. Like I said, the body wasn't meant to heal. It was meant to survive. And we, the practitioners, remove the splinters, remove those compensations so it can actually heal itself. And it can only when it doesn't have to compensate. So my focus is why is it compensating? How do we decompensate it and watch itself heal? Nutrition is a huge part of it. Physiology is a huge part of it, which is why this Rupa uh, Health is, is a great resource for my folks at the orthopedic departments, because when we're addressing the orthopedics and neurology, it just makes sense to support the nutrition, address the inflammation, address the rest of the functions. You know, let's help our patients do life better without, with less medications and procedures and surgeries. Yeah, absolutely. As a, as a child, I had what was called a pallet spreader for my orthodontist. So it was basically this big mechanism on the roof of my mouth and my mom would latch it a couple of times every night. Um, from one personal trainer to another, what type of hip exercises do you see are best? And are there hip exercises that you've seen that are best to kind of help keep those hips aligned and healthy? Yeah, so for the next few, uh, for this question, I'm going to take my dentist hat off and I'm going to put yeah. my dentist hat on. Here you go. Um, basically, when a muscles, when I was a personal trainer 10 years ago, um, that's pretty much how my curiosity was piqued to uh, bring my dental world and my personal training together. Because what I saw was most of my patients that have forward head posture, lumbar extension, they also have class two malocclusion. The class three malocclusions are lacking a lot of um, curvature in their lumbar spine and cervical spine, and their hip is in a posterior position. Ankle positions, pronations, valgus presentations, very classic of patients that have hip instability. And exercises that I loved at the time was core stabilities, doing a lot of dead bugs, doing a lot of activating the glutes, glute medius, because every joint in our body has a set of muscles that do contractions and a set of muscles that do eccentric movements to control the contractions. And then we have ligaments that control how far that joint can go. So we have them in every synovial joint. So a joint cannot go a certain past a certain point. And, and when, the, when the joint is forced to do that because a wrong group of muscles have been employed, and the, the muscle, um, the syntax of muscle coordinations is off because of dysfunction and because of joint mount alignment. Now those, those muscles that are carrying the joint function are going to make it deformed because they are being employed to survive again. We have glute, basically glute meat or TFL, lumbar spine and hamstrings making up for the, for the uh, uh, glute max because glute max cannot be activated to keep the hip in a neutral position. So if we want to keep a hip in a neutral position, we have to understand why the inner thighs are high, um, active. And as a dentist, now I see these two muscles right by the side of the neck, the sternocleidal master that go from the um, earlobes all the way to the clavicles. When we're looking at them being so pronounced and you touch them and the patient's reporting referred pain or just and they have referred pain all over their face and back of their head, we know this is being compromised from either breathing or from the ground up. When this gets overactive, inner thighs get overactive and put the hip and out of function. You can work on the glute max all day long. When the body has to compensate, we'll go back to it. So working on the muscles from the get-go to me, it makes no sense no more because muscles only do one thing, compensate for the new status quo. So silencing them, treating them, Botoxing them, trust me, I've done all of those things, will not do anything other than delaying the obvious until something gives. So addressing the orthopedic alignment to me, that's the first line. Spinal coupling, putting the head over the cervical spine and putting the mandible in the most neutral position and see where the rest of the body needs to be. Basically, correcting the reflexes orthopedically, for me, trumps muscles. But if you want to uh, you know, address them, I think the second stage would be now that we have the orthopedic alignment, let's erase the muscle patterns and retrain them so that we have a better muscle recruitment pattern that's more aligned with. And a lot of times we have to start with the pelvis. I hope that answered the questions. Taking my personal trainer hat off. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I feel like I, I, I could talk to you about that for probably a few hours just in general. Um, like last question. The doctors, good max. Yep, I got all yeah. of those. Thank there you. There we go. <laughs> Thank you, Beth, for hopping in there. Um, yep. 
How much time do you have? The ankle like... bone is connected to the shin bone, is collected to the hip bone. I mean, just figure it out. Figure it out. <laughs> of course, of course. Um, we'll, we'll do these last couple questions here. What's the best way to get rid of pockets? Pockets as in? I am not positive, actually, what they mean about that. So you may want to elaborate. I, did I hear this correctly? Pockets as in pockets in the gum tissue? I'm, I have no idea. Okay, can you clarify? That's because... reading right off of what they said. So if you're still in the chat, if you want to clarify. I'm just that. happy to know that there are postural specialists here listening to this, because if you're treating someone for all of those rectory, you know, uh, um, you know, especially the psoas muscle, inner thighs, TFL, you know, asymmetrical squat, ask the question, where's the head? Why is the hip doing that? And is the head where it is because they have a breathing disorder? Until you fix that first reflex, all bets are off. Everything would relapse. And there's so many doctors here that would love to work with them. And there's so many connections to be made so we can get our patients to home faster. And home is where homeostasis is. Home is when body's not compensating. And I, again, I sound like a broken record, but really that's just what it is. Removing the splinters from the system. Homeostasis, it's the dream. Yep. If you can clarify what pocket is, I can, I can elaborate on dental pocketing, but um, I'm not, is it a pocket muscle TFL? I mean, I'm not quite sure. Yeah, if the, if the person who asked that question is still in here, that'd be good to get some clarification. Um, last one is how would you address the issue of a baby who's not latching? I know that you mentioned that as being an issue. You know, how old is the baby? Because yeah. a baby that's newborn, easy peasy, you know, they need to have their tongue evaluated. Most of the time it's lip and tongue tie. And I don't recommend just releasing the lip and the tongue tie. They need at least a couple of weeks of working with an occupational therapist. And there's so many occupational therapists that can work with getting that child to move their tongue in the right position. Because one of the things that putting the tongue at the proper posture at the roof of the mouth for a latching will do is engaging the nipple with the face and pulling the face forward. That is an actual part of the growth and development and the pressure of the tongue of the roof of the mouth where I mentioned the spot. That's a parasympathetic button. For them, it's soothing. And a lot of times, a lot of these cranial patterns cause the children that are not able to latch to put their thumb in the roof of the mouth and do thumb sucking, which causes a whole nother set of problems for formation of the mouth and high arch palate. So the sooner it's addressed, the less damage caused. Um, talking to dentists that do uh, tongue releases and keep this one in mind, craniosacral therapists are amazing for children because one of the things that's basically causing that torsion and the adhesion is the dora matter that's coming with the cricket skull syndrome. So addressing and putting the hip bones and skull bones in the right position is that vital for that child. Getting them to latch and sleep. Colicky babies are not able to, to latch correctly. So they have so many reflex possibly and breathing issues. Get that child to a couple of providers and within you know two weeks of birth and preferably before they're dismissed from the hospital, but they're not latching. It's a clear indication to have tongue or lip tie. Amazing. And then the last question that will hop in here is, have you had success with a myobrace? Myobrace is a good option, but it requires a lot of uh, cooperation from the child. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, absolutely. It does. It corrects some of the functions and they do. It's a good basic treatment because they have some myofunctional therapy that comes with their app. And I used to use that. That was one of my first choices. But then it's cooperation matter in motivating the child to wear the appliance and all that. Also, I saw a question about torticollis. Torticollis is usually a condition where the occiput is actually more into, I believe, if I'm getting my head correct and correct, that inhalation goes into flexion mode. So torticollis is usually a birth position and fetal presentation problem. Again, a, a, a SOTI chiropractor source is a good place for you. Some of them exclusively work on babies to release that and putting the bones in the correct position while they're still spongy. And craniosacral therapy can help with the with the torticollis. But I would see a chiropractor that's well trained and has good manual skills to address that. Amazing, Doctor Smiley. I'm sorry. The last question is asking. Oh, yeah, there's, no, they're going to keep coming. I know. <laughs> well, guys, I tell you what. You get my email. Send me an uh, send me an email and ask the question. But chronic cough. Remember, I talked about esophageal and reflexes that's actually correlated to the mucus retention because of back flow acidic stump from the stomach, especially kids that are constantly clearing their throat. Of course, things are having so much back flow and obstructive events at night. So um, I really appreciate all you guys. Thank you for all your love you're putting in the comments. I have never been, I mean, this is amazing. I just love everybody just staying around until the end. And hopefully you've watched the rerun, ask questions. And if you guys are interested, I would definitely would love to bring a more masterclass style and uh, bootcamp style so that we can get everybody on the same page and help our patients do better life. This is this has absolutely been one of the uh, the more engaging 
if not the most engaged that we've had an audience. It's such an, such an amazing opportunity for us to be able to have you to host here. Um, and I don't think I've ever been more conscious, uh, conscious of my own posture. So uh, <laughs> I'm realize, your personal trainer, trainer, right? right? Sit up nice and straight. Here we go. For yeah, I mean, of- that's honestly, this is really what it comes down to, Adrian. I think um, most of the personal trainers, and believe me, I've been a personal trainer. I've been trained by chiropractors and I've spoken to my PTs. And clearly, I'm a dentist, so that I conquered that. And I mean, the information is so dispersed. There's so much knowledge we have in wisdom to de- develop the wisdom around it. We're putting knowledge way before the wisdom. And we're going straight to treatment. We're treating way more than we're uh, understanding the, uh, the patient's bodies. And everyone's compensation is different. Everyone's allostatic load is different. We got to have more objective way of assessing patients in collaboration. Remember the soap format. We got to have to cut that in half. The information should not be hindered from any doctor. I need to have access to their blood work, their sleep test, their CT scan and posture analysis and everything related to their health because that puzzle will never be finished if you're missing the borders and the corners. And each one of us are holding one corner, pretty much. I love it. Wonderful. Thank you so much for Thank joining you. us. Thank um, you for all this love and comments. Like I said, I'm just, my heart is full to seeing all this amazing, amazing group of practitioners here. Um, I cannot say this enough. I'll make myself available. Questions? Send yeah. email. And we'll send out we'll send out a recording as well. Um, so your contact will be shared in that along with the slides. So your contact is in the slides. Um, but again, we appreciate you so much for joining. Do you have any final thoughts for the folks before we transition over to a demonstration of Rupa Health? Um, I, that's just about it. Like I said, I, I can see that they continue asking on questions, bringing enthusiasm. Um, I, I'm practically putting a hub together and getting some access to everyone to have the one I have to work with. Um, Folks like myself, we're putting an army together so you're not ever in an isolation to to treat your patients. There's help. We're here to help. Shoot me an email and I will do my best to direct you to where I need it to go. And thank you for being a holistic doctor, a practitioner, or a parent. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. And thank you again for joining us today, Dr. Ismaili. That was fantastic. And for those of you who have a few minutes, I'm going to go ahead and steal the screen and uh, give a probably less exciting talk about Rupa Health and why we're here today and why you're here every week. And we're here uh, every single week prevent, presenting these types of conversations on functional medicine. Um, Rupa Health is a, is a functional medicine lab platform. And the reason why we host these conversations every single week is that we are passionate about bringing root cause medicine and functional medicine to the world. That is our mission. That is our dream. That is our goal. And as Dr. Ismaili touched on you, in order to treat a, a patient properly, we truly believe that you have to find the root cause. And a big component to finding the root cause is by running tests. You know, if you don't know the numbers, how are you going to treat them? And so what we do here at Rupa is provide education, right? We do these webinars every single week. But not only do we provide education on these uh important topics, but we also offer a one-stop shop for you as a practitioner to get access to over 30 different labs and over 3,000 different tests from one single sign-on. So you have access to all your GI tests, all your SIBO tests, all your hair tests and metal tests, your toxins tests. Without having to set up all your separate accounts, you can come to groupahealth.com, create an account for free, and be able to place an order in seconds for everything that you need. Let me show you how simple that is. This is the Rupa Health dashboard that I'm showing you right now. And to start an order, all I need is my patient's first name, last name, and email address. From there, it'll bring me into my order screen where I'm able to place an order within a matter of seconds. I can create custom bundles, which are sets of tests from a combination of any lab that we work with. We can hop down below and we have a favorites list. So you can create a favorites list, which are individual tests that you commonly order. And so if I want to order a GI test, and if I want to order that along with maybe a hormones test at the same time, I have them all just at my fingertips. And then in three clicks, click, 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 I can send that to my patient. Traditionally, you'd have to set up separate accounts with each one of these labs. You'd have to go there to place your orders. You'd have to go there to manage your results. At Rupa Health, we have it all in one place. Not only do you have access to all your labs in one place, but you also have your patient experience taken care of from end to end. So as soon as you place that order on Rupa Health, we'll go ahead and reach out to the patient. We can manage billing directly with them, or you can manage billing yourself uh, and bill the patient separately. We'll reach out and ship the kits to them. We'll send over instructions and FAQs, walking them through how to take the test. We'll answer any support questions that they have. We'll help coordinate the phlebotomies if there's a blood draw required, and we'll even do any specimen issues should ha- something happen that requires recollection. So really all in all, what we're here to provide you with is a one-stop shop 
to get answers for all your functional medicine needs, as well as access to all the tests that you require. Beyond that, we'll offload all that support that's required with these tests, right? The patient experience ultimately can take a lot of time and understanding, fully respecting that, we will offload that entire experience off your shoulders onto ours. So the goal here is to help save you time on all the admin work required with testing off your shoulders onto ours. So you're free to get that time back to build your business, see more patients and really help, uh, you know, cure the world, right? That's what we're here for. Not only that, but as I mentioned before, Rupa Health is free to sign up for. So all you need to do is go to rupahealth.com. You can sign up for free. Uh, if you're a practitioner who's operating in New York, New Jersey, or Rhode Island, I know that we saw those in the comments earlier. Unfortunately, we can't operate with patients there currently, but we are working on a solution for that. Um, you do need a license in order to order tests, but if you are a practitioner whose license may limit your ability to order certain testing, we do have a program called Physician Services, which will partner you with a licensed physician who can order the tests for your patients. So you can still recommend the testing on our platform and you can partner with a licensed physician to order these tests. So it really is accessible to almost every provider out there. With that program, you do have to apply for it, but if you are a licensed physician or practitioner with a an NPI number, you can sign up for uh, Rupa Health and order under your own license. As I mentioned previously, we do a ton of education as well. So beyond just somewhere where you can order all your tests and manage your results, you have access and the ability to learn about all of them as well. So this is the Learn About Labs tab. You can see the boot camps. So the boot camps are something that Dr. Gersmali alluded to. We have more in-depth training than just these one-hour webinars. You can sign up and register for a six-week boot camp, and you can see some of the upcoming ones that we have. We have one including the Dutch test for PICOS and PMS. We have um, another one coming up on the GI map, as well as a handful of others down the pipe. And you can see all the live classes that we have on the way as well. So we have the one, of course, that you're in right now with Dr. Asmali, as well as some other ones that we have coming up with labs, including Mosaic, uh, Boston Heart, and a handful of others. Down below, you get access to all the previous recordings that we've done, as well as a magazine that we have that produces, I think, 100 articles a month at this point, which is absolutely wild. So, so many different resources for you to be able to come and learn. So, with that, y'all, if you do have any questions, again, my name is Adrian Martinez. I'll put my contact information up here. So if you do have any questions, feel free to reach out directly to me and I'll run through a bit. I didn't think I saw any questions coming in. Yeah, so I am a personal trainer as well on the side. It's been more of a passion thing. My full-time gig is here at Rupa Health, but I love helping other individuals meet their health goals. And as a non-practitioner myself, um, you know, helping people achieve a functional lifestyle is really important to me and, and being able to provide fitness uh, and helping in that capacity is really satisfying and fulfilling for me. So here's my contact information. A couple of really cool tools that we have at Rupa outside of just the education and um, of course, having access to all these labs is uh, we have the ability to create a new thing called diet plans. So I'm going to give you guys a little behind the scene sneak peek, if you haven't seen this before, uh, diet plans. So we have, or rather food plans, the ability to create food plans. And so I understand that some of you probably don't handle nutrition on your end, um, but what this does is allows you to create a really quick food plan. And I've actually done this for myself. So if I wanna hop in here, we've uh, integrated some AI in here. And so let's say that I wanna create a food plan for three meals per day and two snacks. And I want to create this as an anti-inflammatory, gluten-free, uh, and dairy-free. Preferences, let's go vegan. Dietary restrictions, allergic to walnuts. From there, I just have those bits of information generate that. And within a matter of seconds, the AI within our system will create a customized food plan. As you can see, broken down, you can edit it, you can create a shopping list based off of this. It's pretty cool. Um, and so for those of you who are, are somewhat new to Rupa Health, um, we are obviously a tech company. And so these types of really unique and innovative features continue to be produced by our team. And so what you're seeing right now is by no means the finished product of what we have. And so you can see just within a matter of seconds, I was able to create 
a food plan for myself, for a client, for a patient, however you want to name it. Um, and again, it's just that simple by clicking a couple quick buttons. So just a little sneak peek as to some of the amazing features that we have outside of the core product here at Rupa Health. Um, but with that, y'all, so it's just is this to go to patient chart and they go to food plan. So to get access to this on your main screen down at the bottom, you'll see food plans. Um, so you don't have to create a new uh, a new order or anything like that. You just hop into food plans and you're able to create it straight away. So super simple to get access to. Um, but with that, y'all, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. My name is Adrian. I'm the head of practitioner partnerships here at Rupa Health. Um, so that's my job is to partner with you as a practitioner to answer your questions, make sure that you're set up for success. And I want to give a huge thank you again to Dr. Ismaili for joining us today uh, for that fantastic presentation and keep an eye out for a few things. I'm going to send a feedback um, email out here in the next few minutes, as well as the recording. Once we have the ability to finish that, whether it's the end of this week or beginning of next week, I'll make sure to distribute that and let you know where to find not only just the recording, but also the slides. Uh, but thank you all for joining us today. And I look forward to hearing from you and seeing you again next week. Talk soon.